Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the course, uh, this introduction to the psychology of bilingualism and multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Verma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur. You know me from some of the courses that I have already taken earlier by the name of uh, basic cognitive processes, uh, advanced cognitive processes, introduction to cognitive neuroscience and introduction to psycholinguistics. This is another course in the field of language wherein I am going to talk about how people acquire multiple languages, how do you use multiple languages and what is the psychology behind it. So join me in this journey of a 20 hour course basically exploring various aspects of bilingualism and multilingualism. I will be using these terms interchangeably so whenever I am using bilingualism uh, people who are multilingual may find themselves included and when I am using multilingualism you already know that I am talking about bilingual, bilinguals as well. Let us start. Now, the first lecture typically in a course is basically about setting some of the ground rules, setting some of the basic conceptual features that we need to talk about and this is precisely what I am going to try and do in this lecture. Now, in this course as I said we will talk about various aspects of bilingualism and as I said I am going to use these terms interchangeably. What I am going to basically talk about will be structured in four basic verticals when I am going to majorly stress let us say on the acquisition of bilingualism say for example how to acquire, how, do, how does one acquire more than one language, how does one learn to use and produce in uh, more than one language, how does one understand in more than one language and finally how does one control two sort of independent may be interdependent linguistic systems within one single head because this is something that has intrigued people for the longest time that how does one person who knows let us say Hindi very well, English very well, maybe uh, Tamil very well, how does this person uh, talk or choose to talk in just one of these languages, do the other languages interfere, if they interfere how does the, how does the person manage this, if they do not how is the system so smooth. So let us start with some of the basic discussions. Now also I will talk about uh, different social linguistic aspects of bilingualism. For example, uh, once you know more than a single language, you are part of maybe more than a single culture. If I know Hindi very well and if I know English very well, I am also party to the cultures and traditions and the traditional knowledge that sort of gets imbibed within a language, I am part of that as well. It is in some sense a sociolinguistic phenomena. It is also in some sense a phenomena wherein I partake or let us say I share my identity with these two let us say slightly different cultures. It happens a lot. It happens in many places where people are uh, compulsively bilingual or multilingual. Do we have different personalities for different languages? Do we? Uh, speak as different people when I am speaking in Hindi as, uh, as uh, compared to when I am speaking in English. These are some of the questions that we will sort of ponder in this course. Finally, I will also talk about the neural and cognitive consequences of bilingualism. When I say neural, uh, I would probably give a disclaimer that I am no neuroscientist but I will tell you a little bit about the brain regions that are involved in controlling uh, and the use and acquisition of more than one languages and also for example example I will talk in some detail about how does bilingualism interact with different cognitive functions such as memory uh, or uh, perception for that matter and so on and so forth. So we will basically see a good mix of cognitive consequences of bilingualism maybe some neural consequences here and there and understand this phenomena in a more holistic level. Understand also that bilingualism adds a certain degree of communicative proficiency to us. It basically makes us capable of communicating to more than just one type of people. It makes us capable of let's say travelling around the world because uh, obviously uh, not everywhere the language that is our mother tongue is spoken. So bilingualism adds certain aspects to our 
personal life, maybe our professional life as well, maybe it enhances our job prospects, maybe enhances our likability. People who know more than one languages are supposed to be or have a better chance to be liked by more than one people. So those are also things that we will talk about. Now, what are the questions that we can ask when we are talking about bilingualism? We can talk about what do we exactly mean by bi or multilingualism? What does it mean when I say that, oh, uh, Ram is a bilingual or Sham is a multilingual? What do these tags entail? And we will talk about them. Uh, is there only one kind of a bilingual? Is there only one kind of a multilingual? Aren't there simply too many varieties? Say for example, uh, I can speak Hindi and English and I can write in them and I can read in them and I can understand them. But I would probably say that I understand a little bit of Urdu as well. But I don't write in Urdu. I cannot read in Urdu. But when somebody speaks to me or say for example, when I hear a ghazal or a couplet, I probably understand it. So. And there are a lot of people who would say that, oh, I know this language, but I cannot read or write in it. I can understand it. I can sometimes speak it, but cannot write in it. So there are different varieties of bilinguals depending upon, you know, the different individual situations that we may encounter. And I'm going to talk to you about them as well. Finally, is bilingualism an individual centric phenomenon or is it a societal phenomenon? Is it something that an individual sort of learns through their own motivation, through, the, uh, through being born in a bilingual uh, family? Uh, is it something that they strive for and they achieve and it becomes sort of limited to them? Or is it more like a societal phenomena where in the society typically the trend is become to be bilingual? Say for example, in the north or in the south, uh, of India that I'm speaking of, uh, people typically learn more than one language. Say, for example, a lot it is it is very common for people to be born to Hindi-speaking parents, but they go to English medium schools and learn English probably as well as they know Hindi. Similarly, in the South, there are multiple languages. Somebody who's born in a Tamil background family uh, would also probably learn a little bit of uh, uh, you know Kannada or Malayalam, uh, but again, maybe going to school will learn English as well. So bilingualism and multilingualism are not merely individual phenomena. They are also phenomena that entire societies participate in and they, it, they serve different purposes in different places. Finally, what are the conditions and causes that uh, you know, lead to the emergence of bilingualism? How does bilingualism come about? Is it typically that, let's say, I'm born to uh, parents who speak both Hindi and English and that is why I will learn uh, Hindi and English together? Or maybe that I go to a school that uh, you know, is uh, teaching in English medium, that is when I learn English? Or there are other broader phenomena that may happen at the uh, you know, larger scale, at the societal scale, at the national scale that make me uh, you know, uh, a bilingual. So there are some of these questions, we will talk about them in some detail. You will see that when I go uh, forward in, these, uh, in this course in different lectures, I will keep coming back to some of these phenomena because these questions are central to understanding what bilingualism is all about. Now let's approach these questions one by one. Let us start with the very simplistic, very uh, uh, you know moderate definition of a bilingual that one can take. Let us define a bilingual as a person who has knowledge and uses more than one language. Very simple, all right. If you know Hindi and in addition you know English or Urdu or uh, Bhojpuri or something like that. Bhojpuri although uh, is uh, more treated more as a dialect than a separate language but let us say you know Hindi and you know English in top, on top of it. Uh, it's probably enough for you to be called a bilingual. Ideally however and again ideal and pragmatic and practical are slightly different terms. Ideally however a person should be able to speak, write, read and understand in both these languages. All right. So for us to be called a complete sort of bilingual, and again, these are slightly loose definitions, uh, one would be uh, expected to be able to, uh, you know, uh, listen, read, write, speak, understand, and all of that in both the languages with a certain degree of proficiency. Now, remember, proficiency is a very important aspect. I may say that I just understand a little bit of English, but I don't speak it. Uh, or I don't write English, but I can read it. So there are these different levels of proficiency that we will, uh, you know, continuously keep talking about. But let us let us start with this very basic understanding that a bilingual is a person who knows uh, to use more than one language at the same time.
let us let us go with that very minimal definition to begin with. So, and as I have already said typically anyone who fits in the above criteria may be referred to as a bilingual, multilingual, but then again experts differentiate between the types of bilinguals based on various factors and we will see those factors as we go ahead. Also as I said bilingualism is not merely an individual phenomena rather it can be termed as a societal phenomena typically arising out of political and demographic changes as well as large scale migrations due to you know sometimes paucity of jobs, better opportunities etc. Now, uh, you know, you might have heard a lot of people say that India has uh, a lot of what they refer to as the colonial hangover. Why do Indians in the world are probably the second largest or probably the largest English speaking population anywhere in the world? It is because that we were colonized by the English and they sort of made some uh, fundamental changes to our education system that made English a very inseparable part of our education. And we have sort of in, in some sense benefited by it in, in some sense that may have been disadvantageous and you can see that uh, governments are trying to address those uh, uh, you know uh, perceived uh, lacunae in, in some sense. Say for example, the new education policy in, uh, announced in uh, 2020 talks a little bit about the benefits of uh, learning to read and uh, you know learning to understand in our native languages. So, there is obviously a political factor behind the fact that why do Indians typically take to English and how they have uh, uh, you know uh, traditionally been taught in English in, in, a, in a large number of our schools across the length of the nation. Also uh, sometimes bilingualism happens or emerges uh, due to uh, large scale migrations from place A to place B. For example, a lot of people uh, migrate to different countries in search of jobs. We know that there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a perception that there are better jobs in the English speaking developed countries of the world and a lot of our people uh, migrate to those places and they pick up some English uh, on the way because they uh, see better job prospects. It may be true, it may not be true, but it can be one of the factors that forces people to learn the second language because if you have migrated to a particular country that speaks a different language and I have lived in parts of Europe and I have seen people from India, uh, you know, uh, different from different parts of India uh, coming there to uh, earn their living and they uh, eventually very successfully uh, learn the language. In, in Germany you can see that, in Belgium you can see that, you can see that in France, you can see that in parts of Italy and similarly uh, you can see that in, uh, you know, in the English speaking parts of the world whether it be uh, the United States of America, Canada or the United Kingdom. Now different kinds of and again this is basically continuing the same discussion different kinds of economic, social, political events may lead to bilingualism from time to time and spur on the acquisition and use of multiple languages. And this keeps happening because societies keep undergoing through uh, you know range of changes and these range of changes sometimes make us uh, let us say realize the importance of knowing more than one language and in, in, in the uh, larger scheme of things people say okay maybe that learning this language at this point in time is uh, beneficial for our future prospects and they pick those languages up. It takes a lot of motivation by the way uh, if you are deciding to learn a second or a third language at a later stage in your life but people do that. Uh, children typically do not have a choice because let us say if they are born to multilingual parents say for example the mother speaks Tamil and the father speaks Hindi, uh, typically the child would learn both the languages and equally well and we will talk about this when we go ahead. How bilingual are we? Is it, is it something that is uh, there in limited parts of the world? Is it something that is a very a widespread, a far uh, spread phenomena? Uh, let us let us survey this a little bit and I have sort of borrowed from uh, Tej Bhatia's book on the handbook of uh, bilingualism and multilingualism from here. Uh, you can see that there are large parts of the world which are bilingual and multilingual. Uh, for example, Canada has two official languages say for example, French and English in different parts of Canada are spoken maybe not exclusively but uh, predominantly. So, for example, French is very common in the Quebec Montreal region and English in other parts of Canada is, is spoken significantly. A significant chunk of their population speaks uh, exclusively uh, English and a significant uh, chunk of the population speaks exclusively French. Uh, 
similarly Belgium where I have lived and completed my PhD, I saw that certain parts of Belgium, say for example the northern parts, spoke Flemish more uh, predominantly than in French and certain parts of Belgium spoke uh, uh, French more predominantly than Flemish. And Flemish is, is a variation of, of Dutch which is spoken in, in regions of Belgium. And there are different cities which will be entirely French speaking cities and there are cities which are entirely uh, Flemish speaking cities. So these kind of political uh, or let us say demographic uh, uh, distributions do exist when we talk about uh, you know certain places. In India for example, if you uh, look at the north, if you look at the south, uh, there are uh, distributions of population who speak more than one language and these distributions are uh, arranged according to linguistic lines, sometimes uh, according to different demographies as well. Now, uh, in the same vein, most of African countries, because they, there is a lot of interchange and the initial languages were uh, the languages of the different tribes. So, uh, typically what you will see when you go to Africa is that most of these, uh, uh, you know, most of the cities and places, people have a basic, uh, a more native tribal language that they speak. But because Africa was colonized uh, by the European countries, uh, you know, uh, Belgium and uh, Netherlands and France uh, for larger periods of time, you will see that uh, typically a lot of African cities uh, have one uh, tribal language which they, uh, you know, uh, use to converse amongst themselves. But they also have a very strong flavor of, let us say, French in some parts of Africa, uh, Dutch in some parts of Africa and so on. All right. And as I said, India uh, exhibits a very strong flavor of bilingualism, mainly most states have their own native language, but typically you will see that all, all of these states of India have English as, as uh, a second language that we learn. Uh, in the southern uh, states, there is a lot of interchange between Tamil, Telugu, uh, Malayalam, Kannada, uh, Uriya uh, maybe uh, in, in some places. In the northeast, there are a lot of, uh, you know, language groups in, in, the, uh, in the north. Typically, Hindi is the more uh, predominantly spoken language, but again, a lot of people speak uh, Hindi along with this uh, speaking and learning Urdu and along with the speaking and learning uh, English for that matter. It is part of our culture to be bilingual. It is not an exception anymore because if you look around, if you uh, talk to your friends and family, you will see that there are hardly people who speak just a single language. Almost everybody would say that I know at least two languages, whether it be Hindi or Urdu, whether it be Hindi or English, whether it be Hindi or Bangla for that matter. Now, let's move slightly ahead and see uh, whether we can sort of understand this, uh, you know, landscape of bilingualism. Different types of bilingualism exist and different types of bilingualism exist in different areas of the world due to different contact situations, due to different reasons through which bilingualism has emerged in those places. For example, and, and to sort of look at this, uh, there are certain theoretical frameworks that may help us. Now, White, for instance, uh, offers three major distinctions or three types of bilingual situations that emerge. Uh, there are cases where there are language minorities uh, which are unique to one state, for example, Britain in France, Britain is a particular language, uh, non-unique but subordinate language, say for example, in Spain, uh, Basque is spoken in Spain and Spanish as well. Uh, and uh, for, say for example, local only minorities where these languages are just limited to very specific regions, say for example, French in Canada, but they for example, in different uh, places, maybe majority languages, French in Canada uh, might still be relatively uh, 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 you know, minority language, but it is a majority language in France. All right, and then also different kinds of connections uh, exist between uh, you know speakers of the same language. Say, for example, adjoining distributions of speakers. Say, for example, Basque in Spain and France again, uh, non-adjoining when uh, French spoken in uh, Canada is is non-adjoining to French spoken in uh, in France. Right. Now, degree of spatial cohesion also is it plays a, a you know bit of a, a factor uh, in how uh, bilingual speakers are uh, organized in, in different places. So, for example, Cree in Canada is uh, uh, situated in a very small region. Uh, everybody is, is uh, there together who speaks Cree. It's a, it's a uh, smaller region in, in, in the country. And where it is uh, non-cohesive is, say, for example, Spanish in the United States of America. There are different pockets of people who speak Spanish and they might not be organized in the same place. They might not be all living in the same locality. 
Another very important aspect of bilingualism and this is something that I would sort of like to uh, stress and emphasize a lot is that bilingualism does not operate in isolation. It operates in a sense where basically we are talking about uh, different situations. Uh, the speakers may learn a second or a third language, but who do they talk to? They basically talk to say the listeners and uh, if you see bilingual speakers are very uh, aware of who they are talking to in what language. Even if say for example, uh, take an example of a school going child where the child is going to a English medium school but parents and family speaks Hindi. So you will see children are very good at uh, switching in and switching out of languages. When they are school, when they are in school, they are more uh, predominantly using English almost uh, you know uh, as comfortably as the natives and uh, when they come to home they start speaking in Hindi uh, without any problem at all. So speakers and listeners this is something very very important the language that they are speaking. Uh, when they are speaking in English, they will speak uh, in, in a certain manner, in a, with a certain formality if I may say so. And then uh, what is the third part that is important is the setting. Where is this conversation happening? You might meet your uh, class teacher, uh, even at uh, older ages, you might meet your, meet your class teacher in a marketplace and suddenly you will, uh, you know, without realizing you start addressing them in English. Because although it is a non-formal setting, it is an informal setting and you might as well uh, speak to them in Hindi. Hindi, but in, in some sense you will see that people are attuned to speaking to certain people using a certain language. Uh, most formal conversations having a conversation with your supervisors, with your bosses, uh, with your teachers may typically happen and uh, for the large part in the language that the office works in, say for example English in a lot of cases and a lot of uh, informal conversations with your friends and with your family. It is very awkward sometimes if you try and speak English to let us say your friends. If, if you are in certain situation and you are talking to your friends uh, uh, who are uh, you know native Hindi speakers or native Tamil or native Bangla speakers as, uh, as it may be, uh, it, it becomes interesting that, that uh, you know uh, people uh, start feeling awkward to talk to them in, in uh, uh, anything other than the native that you have shared. So the speaker, the language and the setting are three very important aspects of this whole bilingualism setting, of this whole bilingualism conversation that we uh, you know are going to talk about again and again and going forward. Now similarly, uh, if you want to understand bilingualism and you will see in, in future lectures that uh, when I talk about this in more detail that you can study a particular phenomena using different disciplinary perspectives or different disciplinary lenses. For example, you can talk about bilingualism from a neuroscience perspective that okay, what really happens in the brain that allows us to pick up more than one language. What happens in the brain when we produce uh, in a second language or a third language? How does the brains, uh, let us say there are regions in the brain that may be linked to uh, comprehension of language, what really, how, how do those regions change? Do these regions actually change? Or is the brain different in bilingual, multilingual people than in monolingual people? Uh, again, these are questions that I am leaving open for now and we will talk about them as we go ahead. But you can take a particular perspective to study uh, any given phenomena. So neuroscience perspective can be one. Uh, a perspective could be a more sociological perspective, say for example, uh, you know, uh, what are the societal factors that lead to uh, bilingualism? What are the factors that govern uh, the motivation of people in learning a second language or a third language in continuing to use a second or a third language? And in some cases, is stopping to use a particular language. Say for example, uh, certain sociological changes, uh, demographic changes may have happened that people in, in India uh, who were probably predominantly speaking Sanskrit uh, for the longest time uh, went away from speaking Sanskrit to variations of uh, you know uh, a, a Hindi and eventually the kind of language that we speak is called Khadi Boli. So how did, how did it happen that we were speaking a particular type of Sanskrit uh, many many years ago and we switched to different kinds of Hindi and then we sort of now speak what is called a very loosened sort of form of Hindi which is called Khadi Boli. But uh, if you look at the current generation, they speak not only, uh, not merely in Hindi but they speak in something called English which uh, you know people uh, refer to as a mix of Hindi and English uh, at least for the northern part. A linguistic analysis would say for example if you want to study this as a linguist, you will probably uh, you know spend a little bit more time in understanding 
the structural changes that come along with bilingualism. For example, what happens when speakers mix Hindi and English? What happens when in one single mind both Hindi and English reside together? Do their, uh, does their Hindi remain as pure as it uh, remains in a uh, native Hindi speaker's uh, language? Does their English uh, remain as pure as it uh, were in a uh, native speaker's language? So what really happens? How do these languages interact with each other? Do their structures sort of collide? Do their structures influence each other? Do they modify each other? And, uh, and you can see, uh, you know, around you that, you know, there are very interesting uh, uh, instances when somebody would be speaking in uh, English, but sometimes using the syntax of Hindi totally. Uh, syntax is the grammatical property. So, for example, you start to frame a sentence, uh, but uh, you're using words of English, but say, uh, but uh, using the syntax of, uh, of uh, English, uh, using the uh, sentence of uh, uh, English, using, uh, using the syntax of Hindi or vice versa. So, what kind of changes happen to these languages? Say, for example, a lot of uh, Hindi has borrowed terms from English. Uh, English has also, in, in, in a sense, borrowed terms from Hindi. For example, the words pajama, this and that are there in the Oxford Dictionary. So, uh, what really happens to languages, structurally speaking, uh, when two languages come in contact with each other would be the subject of, uh, you know, uh, analysis of linguists. And social psychological analysis, for example, what, what does it do to our identities, what does, what does it do to our group uh, belongingness, what does it do to our social cohesion, uh, does it basically uh, influence us, uh, uh, you know, in order to sort of, oh, I will speak, uh, it is a matter of pride for me to be able to speak in good English. You know, and, and in India, it is a sort of, uh, I would say, a bit unfortunate, but it's, it's very common uh, for people to attach a lot of uh, pride to be speaking in English uh, and not knowing their own language in, in, in a lot of cases. So, is it is it that, uh, is it is a matter of uh, self-esteem? Is it Does it raise your uh, position in the society? Does it make you uh, seem that you're coming from uh, an extremely uh, high social class that you uh, speak uh, uh, purely in English but not in Hindi and, and, and I've heard a lot of people say that oh I'm not very comfortable in Hindi even though it's my native language. Oh I'm not very comfortable in speaking in Tamil or Bangla because uh, but uh, you know although it's my native language I speak uh, more or less in, in English uh, exclusively almost. So there are some of these factors which uh, you know need our attention and we might sort of dwell upon them a uh, little bit here and there as we go ahead. All right. So that's all that I wanted to say in this in this uh, initial lecture and uh, join me in the next lecture when we sort of start, uh, you know, delving a little bit deeper into the phenomena and the different aspects of bilingualism. Thank you.